Right, that's us live. Hi everybody, so welcome to my first podcast. Obviously my name's Scott Ramsey, and you've probably seen my, my platforms, Ramsey Outdoors, with my, my drones and my camping and stuff. But I'm proud to say I've got my first guest today, Paul Boggy. Welcome Paul. Hello mate, how are you? Fantastic man, for that have you on. So, a bit about myself guys, I serve with Paul for, in, the, in the battalion in London um, and in Catrick. Um, I served 16 years with the battalion. Done a few operational tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, been to Germany, Poland, Canada, all over the world with the, with the battalion, great battalion. Um, so my aim is for this platform is to raise awareness for PTSD um, and veterans and servicemen and women that are still serving for their country and have been injured and also people that have had trauma in their life as well. So Paul, I just want you to start mate, a bit, introduce yourself, um, so tell us about growing up and stuff, your family's back home. So if you want to tell us about start off with that, please, Paul. Yeah, so my name is Paul Bogate. Like Scott just said there, I served with him in the Scots Guards. Um, I'm from Edinburgh, in case you cannot tell from the accent. Um, I'm an East Coaster. So, yeah, I grew up in Edinburgh, council scheme, second eldest. My mum had four boys. I'm the second eldest. Had a, a good upbringing. Um... You know, my mum and dad both worked multiple jobs to keep us in clothes and they were they were stripped. I got my arse scalped more times than I care to remember, so, as did all my brothers, actually. But it kept us in line. It was not child abuse, right? It was just what happened in the 80s. You got your arse scalped for misbehaving. So, aye, life, life was good, you know. Went to the Beavers, the Cubs, the Scouts, um... Played a lot of football. I was shite, but I still played. Um, aye, in life, you know, I was, I was, I was integrated into a, into a gang early on, and I didn't really know. How old were you, Paul, when that happened? Were you, were you quite young then? Primary, primary school. Jesus, that's young, eh? So, so you're talking about 11, 12 year old then at the time? Younger. Younger, younger than that. Um... The, th- the thing was, we didn't really know it as a gang. We were called y- we were called YCT, right? But what it was is, it was... Um, it's palsy. Aye, but r- really the, the thing, when I when I look back now, the thing that I remember the most was, I'm an eight-year-old boy, right? I'm still at primary school. I'm going out at night time playing football and stuff. Some of my pals are in their early 20s. You couldn't have that today. You no. couldn't have that today. Not because they'd be like that pedo, you know what I mean? Aye, but no. these guys that I was oh, hanging yeah. around with, do you know, they're aye. in their early 20s and stuff. They're that's drinking buck... That's men, in it? It's men, you know what I mean? It's, aye. They're, they're drinking buck fast and that every night, you know? I, I didn't know them, but they were alcoholics, a lot of them, right? And we were we were all used to hang around about 50, 50 strong, 50 strong for ages for 8 years to 21, Right, and we all, we all just used to hang about together, and then um, we used to get bored at night time in Edinburgh. There was nothing to do, like so. We used to set fires to shit, and we used to throw um, bricks at police cars and and shit like that because we would get a chase, right. and they would chase us through the back gardens. Was it a rough area, Paul? There, where you lived, or was it just just normal war? It was. It was. It was a pretty rough area. But the thing was, I grew up there, and so did, like, all my family. And it was, it was back then in the early 80s, it was quite close-knit. So everybody knew everybody, like, you know, you, like, my friends, mum and dad, knew my mum and dad. So there was that community there, isn't it? That was close, aye. Very much a community spirit there was in Craig and Tinney. Very much so. Um, problems did arise when anybody out with the area that was not known came into the area. Then the shit hit the fan, and I, I used to see a lot of people getting beaten up for just for simply walking through the area, didn't do nothing else, um, just for having a a walk along where we used to hang out. There was always one gobshite within the gang that would say something or spit on them or kick them 
just minding their own business, Scott, and then they would react and say something. And as soon as the person, the innocent bystander, would react, then all the older boys that could fight and they were like, you know, they might be only 16, but they were like, big boys, big, right. oh, men. And then they would all, and then the person would get a kick in and stuff. And it was just a bit like that. But for me in that area, it was it was just normal. It was just life. Everybody seemed to seemed to get on, um, you know. And then obviously like drugs and stuff. There was like my friends who were um, buzzing gas and sniffing glue. That was a big thing back then when I was wee. Um, a lot of cannabis, a lot of alcohol. But that's that at an early age for you then, all this, all this, with the people young about, was it quite, so you were quite young, so this started quite early then? No, because the truth is, it, I was around it all. But you never right? it then, no. But I had a fear that my mum and dad would absolutely kick my ass if I ever went near a, a joint or a joint of cannabis or a bottle of Buckfast yeah. at eight years old. I had that fear. And then my brothers were in the same gang as me. So... It was like my big brother would give me an absolute kick in if he ever seen me with a bottle of Buckfast at eight year old. And I knew that. So I tried it and I dabbled. And, I, and the truth is, I didn't like it. I didn't like how cannabis made me feel, how alcohol made me feel. And um, I, go through, I go through life really being in amongst it, Scott, but never actually delving into it like what some of my friends did. And I thought I'd sort of escaped. I thought I'd, I'd sort of escaped that that world. Um, I was a boy racer. I ended up getting a car, and you know, I, I used to like going up in Edinburgh along Princess Street, burning the front, burning the tires off my front two, my front wheel drive Fiesta, and that. Um, yeah. And that was my life. And then, the age of eighteen, um, heroin just flooded into the area, and. We didn't really know. We didn't know what it was. Our education at school was a picture of a spoon, Aye. a picture of a needle, oh, and a picture of a belt, and it was say no to drugs, and it was a big poster on the wall. I can remember that as well. Why the school? I can remember yeah. that. Yeah, my mum and dad would say, "Tell us heroin's bad; it'll kill you." Um, you know, and anybody that you would speak to, you know, would tell you the same thing. So when heroin came into the area, basically the group of guys, my pals that I was hanging around with, all started chasing the dragon, which is smoking heroin on tinfoil. So I was very naive. I had no fucking idea what they were, what they were doing. So, but they were all doing it. And I remember finding out the first time um, what chasing the dragon actually was. And then when my pal said it's heroin, and I was like, shut the fuck up. There's no way my pals are fucking taking heroin right now because they had the sort of same upbringing and knowledge as what I had is that heroin fucking kills you. Wow. So very naively back then, when I seen flashes of tinfoil, there wasn't any belts, and spoons, and needles. So, in my mind, as a young eighteen-year-old man, I'm thinking it can't be that dangerous. Then, oh, it's safe enough, right? Uh, that's what I think. That's what I'm thinking. All oh, my pals are fucking doing it. So, but were, is... these close, were these close friends, Paul? You've known for years that, that, that started this, and also got you there. I, I. So I grew up with them for you know nursery age, yeah, and we. All that. We stayed in the same area, we were in the same gang all the way through life. And then by the time we're getting to the, the age when I'm 18, um, you know, we're free, probably 16 year old to 21. There was 11 or 12 of us that used to hang about the same every night and that got really close. And it was all, it was almost every one of them that started um, taking heroin. Sadly, um, a lot of my friends have died now as a result of their drug use. Um, and some of them are still on heroin right now. And I see them. 
and I think, fuck, I, I really did dodge a bullet there. When I see, when I see th their lives now and what what they're about. Uh, the effects, the effects of them and stuff like that. Um, yeah. I saw Paul, when did you recognise when you went, I've got a problem here. There's something needs to stop. Um, so when did you, uh, listen, I need to get off of this. When did you first think you were, when that hit you? When was the first time you, you think that, that happened to you? So I remember, I remember the first time feeling that I had fucked my whole life and I'd signed my own death for it was when I was going cold turkey and I felt ill for the very first time. And I didn't even think I was a heroin addict at this point. So um, we were the heroin. So this you try to come off it then? Aye, right. so this, so no, it wasn't a through choice, Scott. We were trying to get heroin and there was, uh, there was a drug bust, so we couldn't get any. And we were all sitting there feeling ill. We managed to get the heroin. And then as soon as I took the heroin, I felt amazing. It took away all my physical, the shivers, the belly ache, the migraines. The pain, everything. Took away everything and it felt amazing. And I remember vividly thinking to myself, what the fuck have I done? I'm a heroin addict now because the realisation was that that heroin was like my medicine to make me feel better. So I go through life um, instantly giving up. So I just give up on, on, on all aspects of life because I'm going to kill myself soon because I'm a heroin addict. So then I start, drugs-wise, I'm fucking taking crack, magic mushrooms, ecstasy, LSD, um, amphetamines, gabapentins, tramadols, swallowing drugs, Valium, all the benzos, swallowing all drugs, like they're going out of fashion, fucked up my whole life. Start to um, drop the weight, big black circles under my eyes, and um, my life had just become a mess, and I'd given up. Um, and then, as my life goes along, I'm thinking, like, I'm just waiting, I'm just dying this slow death now, and my mum and dad are begging me to stop, and my brothers and all my aunties and uncles are begging me to stop, and I promise them that I'm going to, and I never call? do it. They knew then that this was happening then. Aye. Aye. It was clear to see physically, you Aye. know, how much these drugs were having an impact on me. And then when the real the moment I realized that I needed help. So <clears throat> prior to that I used to cut my arms as a cry for help. So far, Paul, why? It was a cry for help. It was like to say to people, my friends, right, I'm fucking struggling with shit right now and I need your help because I'm cutting my arms. But I was never trying to commit suicide or that. But that's what, what happened. And then I had this fucking bright idea that night to to um, to commit suicide because I had enough of this horrible evil world that I live in. I've seen nothing but human beings being horrible and nasty to other human beings. Um, I was not able to stop taking drugs for my family, who I love with all my heart, and I was not able to stop for them. So I had this self-talk going on that I'm just nothing but a fucking waste or scumbag. Um, Angel, Angel, my, the whole scenario. Aye. My, my, my family would be better off without me, and I convinced myself full-heartedly that, that was the case. So... From that moment, I'm like, right, I'm going to just, I'm just going to, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to take a, an overdose and then that'll be the end of it. So I went through that whole night and um, when I woke up the following morning, Scott, and there was this hundreds of tablets all over the rug and I fell asleep on the rug that, you know, when I woke up, that gave me the biggest fucking fright of my life because how close I'd come the night before to doing something um, horrendous. And you didn't get any lower than that, because the no. only step lower than that is fucking no being here. Oh, it's like, it's like I've, I've always said, like, the, the stuff that you've been through and that. And, but me with my PTSD, I was, if I'd never met Pamela, I wouldn't be sitting here today, Paul. And it's it's like, in, insight's a good thing. You know what I mean? Somebody asked me the other day, it's, it's like, if you know what was going to happen to you, would you have still joined up? I went, in a heartbeat, I. 
because I wouldn't say a bad word about the army because what the army gave me is something that I've not got today, like my, my, my kids, family, my mates that are still mates, obviously. Um, but it was Pamela, she went like, you need to go and get help. Um, but if it wasn't for her, mate, I wouldn't be here today. So it's just like, can you, you think how bad you were? Like yourself and also myself, how bad, can, how bad was her? But she's seen this, you know what I mean? And I've, I've thought about it, can I've sat in my mum's before I moved up here, because I was loving my mum at the time, my mum and dad. No idea when in your 40s. But my mum and dad were worried there, they were, you, you can see it in their faces. For me, I could see that, maybe the same for you, mate, but I could see the worry in their faces. And I sat one night, because I'm, I'm still taking medication to this day, I'll take it for the rest of my life, and I was sitting. And it's sexually in the eyes of pan, all that type of stuff. And I had it on my hand, I went, if I just take this, that would be it. And I don't know what it was. I'm not spiritual or that, but I do believe, but I'm not that type of person, you know what I mean? I do believe. I, honestly, God, this hand, on my bed in my mum's house. And this voice says to me, Scott, didn't do this. And it was weird because I recognised the voice, but I didn't know if, if that makes sense, Paul. So I binned them, you know what I mean? And it was hard, really, really hard for me um, to leave in the four seasons of the transition. Just like when we spoke about trolls, normal life, I, I was finding difficult. Um, and I had the treatment, mate, and I finished the treatment, and I feel great, you know what I mean? That was M EMDR um, with the psychiatrist and that, and I've got that. I'm still not 100%, but like I say, with yourself, is seeing the face on your family's, the worry in their faces, uh, and what they must have felt. And you didn't, didn't realise that at the time, until you're like, well, wait a minute, I was like that. And it's no fair name, you know what I mean? So, I've got the help, mate, and I'm, I'm working now, back into a routine, which is a big, big thing for me. Doing this will help me, I think. Um, but it's like you say, Paul, with your family, did they try and help as much as they can? Did they try and stop it? Did they try and keep you in? Did, did they try and... You know what I mean? Also, try and keep you away from these type of people or stuff like that. What was, what was anybody trying to deal with you? They knew the people that I was hanging about with were a bad influence. Right. And they knew who they were because they grew up in the same area. They knew their mums and dads. So they knew the family. Um, they knew it was pointless to try and get me to stop hanging about with them. Um, I remember when I first told them about me being a heroin addict, um, Something changed with all my brothers and my mum and dad instantly. Um, from that moment on, the relationship changed with them all, and I seen pity in their eyes. I I seen how how just pity, and I hated it, and it and it really, it really affected me. And I didn't want to feel that emotional about seeing my mum and dad when they're talking to me and seeing how distraught they were. So I would take more heroin, because heroin will help me forget about what I'm putting my mum and dad through. So I just ended up taking heroin to forget about what I had become. So... Was that in the house, Paul? Or would you take it in the house as well? Your parents' house, or would you... Aye. Yeah. So my mum and dad, well, I would say... My dad's never cleaned. My dad's never cleaned my room in his lifetime, so I'm not going to claim that he's ever done that, right? But my mum would clean my room and change the bed sheets and stuff. And um, obviously, my mum didn't. My mum doesn't know anything about drugs and stuff. But like, I used to, I used to lose the shit at my mum because she would go in my room, but and there's fucking. There, there, there's all these leftovers and resi residue of heroin on tinfoil that I kept for if I ever went cold turkey and I wasn't able to get it. So they're just like little bits. And I used to have them all stashed under my bed. And I used to go in. And I'd be like, oh, fuck, my room door's open. So my mum's been in the room. She's changed the bed sheets. And then I'd go through and say, mum, where's all the tinfoil that was under the bed? She went, what is that? It's all black, like it's been burnt. And I'm like, that's my drugs. I need them, where are they? And I've been them. I went, no, you never. She went, you, you shouldn't be taking that in this house. If you want to take all your drugs and all that, do it somewhere else, you're not doing it in the house. So we would have arguments back and forward and all that, and I never stopped. I still kept doing it, and I just kept stashing it somewhere that she never cleaned. Um, you know, but... They always, they always supported me. They always tried to encourage me to, to stop. And time and time again, I promised them that I was going to stop. And I meant it with all my heart. 
I'd look them in the eyes and say, this will be the last time. Give me £20. This will be the last time I ask you for money because I'm going to stop. And they would give me money. I'd go and get heroin. And then 24 hours later, I'd be back at them. Can I get another £20? And I promise this time I'll stop. So they funded, they helped fund my addiction for a while. But then it got to the stage where I was getting out of control. And then, you know, it was tough love a lot of the times as well. Where, and I knew it. I knew I was pushing my luck with my mum and my dad, right? Um, and I ended up leaving. You know, and I was homeless for a while. I was just jumping, jumping here, there, and everywhere. As long as I had drugs, I wasn't bothered. My arse about where I slept if a night time. Um, I bought a wee car, a wee Fiat Panda for 40 quid. I bought a car and I used to sleep in the car at night time with my sitting Chase the Dragon on the back seat. Um, and that was my life. Um, you know, and I think that if I never... You know, when I woke up that morning after my, my, my suicide episode, if, if I never had that realisation, I need to help myself. Yeah. Right? There's no point in relying on my family. There's no point in relying on the government. There's no point in relying on anybody. Right? I need to get help, but it has to come within me to do it. So... I went and I went and um, seeked help. A charity in Edinburgh accepted me onto a course about the power of the mind, the conscious mind, self-conscious, creative subconscious, and all these amazing things, right? Self-talk. They were teaching me about self-talk. And it was like, it was the most amazing course. I had nothing to do with addiction. And then on the 14th of May, I'm 19 years of heroin. 19. That's a, like a that's a lifetime, and it's that's like, amazing. and amazing. it was all to do with um, this thing, amazing thing called self talk. When when I understood how dangerous the way that I look at, at myself, and when I look in the mirror, Scott, right, as a 18 year old, 19 year old, 20, 21, all, the, all that time I'm on heroin. If I'm looking in the mirror every single day and saying to myself, you're nothing but a junky scumbag that's no worth anything. Look how you're ugly. You're this, you're that. All these negative things that I used to think about myself. If I'm doing that every day, it's no wonder I ended up on drugs and heavily depressed. I mean, you're worse. It's self belief in that. I know it's not getting you. It's, uh, you're just in a bad place. Like so, it's, that was. But when this guy taught me, and this is what I try to do on social media now, is try and pass that on. What I was taught was yeah. that the way that we look upon ourselves is all that matters, and it's a choice. So I, I chose to stop being so harsh and critical about the way that I looked physically. And I chose to be less critical of the mistakes that I'd made that I held my hands up for, right? I'd, I'd been, yeah. you know, I'd made loads of mistakes. Yeah. But for me to move forward in life, if I was going to live a life in the past, I'm always going to be depressed, always. So I had to, I had to face my demons, acknowledge the thing, mistakes that I'd made, apologise where I needed to apologise. Some were received well. Some I was told to fuck off, blah, blah, blah. You know, and it's fine. What matters is I was trying to change my life. And then, you know, I go through cold turkey. Uh, I go back, I get a car again, right? So I'm back behind the wheel. I'm working in a supermarket, um, driving a forklift again, amazing. Get a flat. I start running. Flip my addiction for heroin to running. Fitness. I'm Forrest Gump in it in fucking Edinburgh every day. Um, start the boxing. Start taking up boxing. Boxing really helped with my anger management. Um, it helped me offload a lot of stuff. So I started to pound a heavy bag every day. Started doing weights every day. This whole I changed my whole life. And then I'm sitting in the canteen. Um, I'm 29, almost 30. 
sitting fucking through the paper on my 15 minute break. Army, be the best. Seen it, fucking jumped to it. was only a fucking wee article, Scott, right? Hi. But it jumped to it, mate. And I always remember thinking, do you know what? I didn't want, I didn't want to draw my pension. No, no disrespect to anybody working in a supermarket, right? But I didn't want to be in, in Morrison's for my whole life. I just felt like I need to do something. And if it's not too late, then I can do it now. So the cutoff age used to be 27 for the armed forces, right? And I was nearly 30. So I, I believed I was too old. Walking along Edinburgh one day, along uh, the High Street, Army Recruitment Centre. Don't know even why to this day that I walked in. Walked in, sat down, corporal on that, took my name. And then the office right there is a fucking pipe major for the Scots Guard sitting there at his office, interviewing this fucking 17 year old laddie that's got suits, a suit and everything on. The young laddie leaves, shouts on me. And I walk in and he goes, like, uh, fuck's sake, how old are you? And I say that back then it wasn't a yes, sir, no, sir. I just say, uh, 29, nearly going to be 30. He says, are you fit? I says, aye. I says, I run every day. I'm doing the boxing. Um, I'm in the gym lifting weights and that every other night. He says, good stuff. Um, I'll get you Scots guards. So that's how it started then, Paul. Why? So see the transition for obviously getting yourself better and stuff like that. And with that, that pro, I know the process you need to do your, your two days in Embra, your fitness test and that and form application form. Did you need to disclose also what's went in on the past with your addiction and stuff like that? But you need to tell them this is this is what has been happening. It's harmed, but I'm I'm off that now, and I'm trying to do this my life. So did you have to explain yourself when you were in that 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 interview process, the process to join up? Aye. So it came the the, the dreaded day for the medical, and I'm thinking, fuck's sake, right? Like it doesn't matter how fucking fit I am, right? It doesn't matter. I'm going to the medical. I need to pass somebody there with the, somebody there with a the notepad and pen, right? They asked me to take my clothes off, do it in my boxer shorts. They asked me to leap around like a fucking frog on the flare. So I'm leaping around like a frog. He's asking me all these questions and all. He says, you're, you're, you're extremely fit for your age, right? And I was like, thanks very much, sir. He said, have you ever had any problems with alcohol or drugs in the past? And my fucking heart sank. <laughs> so I was like, fuck. I can't lie. No. I couldn't lie. So I said, I used to be a heroin addict. I went, oh. He says, what with the age? I says, for the, for the age of 18 to 25. He says, do me a favour, sit up on the bed. I've still had my boxer shorts on, right? And I've sat up on this fucking medical bed. And he says, I'll be back in a minute. Fucking 15 minutes the fucking dick left me on that bed. And my heart had sank. I'm sitting there and I think I fucked it. Why did you know lie? You should have just fucking lied, right? But I would have been chasing that lie uh, for my whole life, Scott, right? So I'm glad, obviously, that I did. So it's like, beat myself up. You're not going to get in. They're not going to accept you. And then 15 minutes later, the door goes, comes in. He says, right, Paul. He says, that's you. He says, I've had to just go and check that there. Um, you know, you've been clean off, off the heroin for long enough. You're in very good physical shape. Enjoy basic training. Handing me a wee bit of fucking paper. And I was like, what? I've just been fucking accepted into the army. And I'm like, no way. I couldn't wait to phone my mum and that. Because, bro, bro, you know, I... like, and I was like, I'm 30. You're right, fucking 30 years old. Like, one of the oldest to ever join the regiment at that age. And, and Pax was the same. Pax, he was, I think he was ages with you when he done at Purbright age. So he was, and he was quite, he was fit and awful. So age, age is just a number, mate. You know what I mean? Aye. But also, with the, with your same with your medical night, you must have been thinking to yourself, oh, God, I'm going to get caught out here. That, also, that must have crossed your mind a lot, eh? And also, there's like also the reaction for people like we we go to basic training, they need to know about you. So did you disclose that in basic training as well to your instructors and stuff like that? No, well that's a funny thing, right? So I left Edinburgh, gone down to fucking Cataract, right? And uh, meet up with all the guys. Everybody's all suited and booted and everything, right? Nobody knows anybody, but I might be with a banter on the train and all that. Oh, yeah. Um nobody knew anything about me. So we get off the coach, because they pick us up at Darlington. And they run us into Cataract. And then we're all getting off the coach. And then the the sergeant comes out and shouts at us and says, right, get in three ranks. <laughs> what the fuck is that? What the fuck's he shouting about? Three ranks. 
Like, what the fuck does he mean? It's like, yeah, I fucking punch your text. This is what it is, and blah, blah, blah. It sure does. So we're all standing there. And then they're coming round. All the sergeants, the cold stream and Grenadier and Welsh guards all come out, right? All to greet us and everything. And uh, they come to me because they're meeting everybody individually, right? And they come to me and it's, fuck's sake, how old are you? And I say, he's 30, sergeant. He's where, where are you for? I said, Edinburgh, sergeant. He says, wait a minute. Are you that smackhead for the East Coast? that's coming down to try and join up to be the guards. Oh, yeah. Seriously. Right? And I was like, and then you heard all the sniggering. Oh, everybody was sniggering, right? The, like, the, the NCOs and all the uh, trainee guardsmen. Everybody's, like, sniggering. It's like, shut the fuck up, you lot. Right? So, um, what happened is the medical officers had obviously passed on the information to the cataract. So, Could by the time I got there, oh. fucking everybody knew. Jesus Christ. I saw how was training Paul known. Can did they, did they mention it to you or like did they speak to you? Can bring your room and say that everything all right? Can they, how was training through that through that process known that these instructors knew that was your lifestyle back then? Was there any negativity for other guys or any? No. That what happened was um, initially when I didn't know, I didn't know the guys. There was a lot of whispering, and there was a lot of like, probably like name calling and all that. There's no fucking way he was a smart kid or what blah, 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 or whatever, right? And then. We went out for the, I think it's on the second day, Scotty. Like, can you go out for your mile and a half best effort? Right? So you go out for that, right? Oh, and it's the kid. I've been fucking Forrest Gumping it for the last year. Oh, my God. So I was like, there's no no, no dramas here. Right? So 50 are set off mile and a half. We all go and run a mile and a half. And I come in third. And for that moment, that was the first time we met the company sergeant major would come out to meet us and all that, and all the NCOs and the officers were there for the first time. Yeah. And then, um, you know, you, I, like if you didn't know, obviously Scotty knows, right? But when you when you go in and do your mile and a half, you get a time. And as you come in, you, you, you line up in the order that you come in. So there I was, number three, and coming out, and then the sergeant, the sergeant saying to the sergeant major, Hey, sir, this is trainee guardsman Bogey um, from Edinburgh. And then the officer says, oh, trainee guardsman Bogey, are you the one that had some issues with drugs in your in your earlier years? Get very posh. And I was like, yes, sir. And he said, oh, so but there was a lot of sniggering, right? Doing the line. And the sergeant major says, hey, you lot, shut the fuck up. Right? And they all stopped. And they went, look, look. Look up the line, and there's all the all the wee heads for the fucking 18, 19 year olds are looking up. Look where he is. He's just well, came in third, right? Well, I did. I, I mean. all you, so uh, let's just stick it in. So straight for the offset, they had a little bit of respect for me, I believe, right? Because I'd already lived a life. Um, Aye. I was older. So you were experienced, Paul. You were more experienced than the younger ones. Aye. But even all the NCOs, Scotty. Like, my sergeants and all that, they're only, like, 25. And I'm 30. So the respect, so the respect was there straight away, basically? Aye. For most of them. Some of them are wankers, right? Well, not going to say any names. Aye. Right? But Aye, most part, <laughs> most part, like, a lot of them had a lot of respect for me. They asked me openly about my, my drug use and the heroin days in Edinburgh. And we had a lot of banter. I was a gobshite. So there was a lot of banter back and forth. And I had a lot of laughs and stuff. And that carried me through... I only served for five years because I broke my back. But um, for the five years that I had in, in the basic training and then F Company and then going to the battalion and stuff, like, I sensed there was a, an element of respect. I was never claiming to be the best soldier and I never was going to be the best soldier. I was respectful to... Oh, um, I was respectful to everybody. But even then you were in... Can you were older, like, but you were your robustness was good. It's always it's always been there, eh? You know what I mean? And, and I, that's I that. Me- it, it was yeah. that mental attitude that I'd Aye. already instilled. You know what I mean? But the younger ones, we younger guys, maybe have no got that, like you say in your basic training, as we had. Also, Lee Paxton, who was a regiment something to the battalion there, and he was that age. But he was always in the top three, Paul. And you go like that. Ah, well, he's he's doing it. Well, if he can do it, I can do it. You know what I mean? And Pax yeah. was great because he talked to you. Listen, mate, come on, even back then he was like, come on, you can do this. And I, I was, we done pub right. So I was, I left home at 18, eh, went and done, 
greeting on my phone, my mum at 18, I want to come home, no, you're not coming home. And it was Pax that said to her, come on, you can do this, man. Because we'd done 14 weeks pub right and 14 weeks car trick, but I know it's changed to 32 weeks now, isn't it? It's all like car trick now, it's changed. Yeah. Because um, back then, that was a guard depot, and it was honestly horrible, man. You had 14 beds, 14 lockers, and turn roof, sleeping in your fucking guard tracksuit on. You know what I mean? Oh, mate, itchy blanket. There was no duvies or that. It was all itchy blankets. You know what I mean? Aye, but, but you said obviously being, being older and the training, that, that's that respect that you go for the guys. And obviously when you get to the, see when you go to the battalion, Paul, or whatever you came, but was it F Company? Did you get any negative anybody else in there? Also, like, like, like your senior ranks or was it any of that at all in, in the battalion or in F Company? Nothing. No, also, they knew, I, like, also they knew what's went on whilst your report coming through for car trick and stuff like that. Aye, so obviously what what had got out like about my 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 past life, but what but what I found that people were saying was um, through written reports and also it's verbally true. to it's me true. and verbally what overheard was, look, he is an old bastard, right? He did used to be on the smack, but I'll tell you what, he's one of the fittest guys we've got right now. Yeah, so there was always that fitness aspect that really, you know, his drills know the best, his rifle skills are know the best, right? He's got go a lot of work today, but he's fitter than all these guys. So that sort of saved me. My physical, the physical side that really saved me to no get a really hard time. <clears throat> they might have been calling me a wanker behind my back, perhaps, right? But the written reports that I got was everything was all optimistic. Um so I was just going along for the, I was just going along for the ride. Like you know, I've, I've changed my life. You know, I've been in that, in that cesspit, and now I'm standing outside Buckingham Palace, or I'm following, I'm following guys like you for the first time in Windsor, because that was the very first time in F Company that I, one of the first, first times I ever met you was. Um, I've got my eye. And the, the one of the first bollockings you ever gave me <clears throat> was we were leaving Windsor, right? And I'd had my tunic in that one for the first time and you were going to post post people on, right? And um, we were marching up the hill and I always remember it was roasting summer, summer's afternoon. I always remember watching up, right? And um, there was a few Chinese tourists that were lingering and I noticed them. I clocked them. And I was like, right, Scott is going to veer to the left or veer to the right here, right? And take us with him. And you never, you stayed on the track that you were on, right? And these, they were all watching you, right? And I think they were just curious about what was going to happen. And then you just shouted, you just bellowed out, make way for the Queen's Guards, right? And I, like, that's the first time I'd ever heard it, right? And I just, I love the fact that you were just going to go straight through them. They moved, they did move, right? But I found it very humorous. So I'm marching up behind and I'm fucking trying to keep her cool. I'm sniggering like a little fucking kid, right? Laughing. And you're like, bogey, fucking shut the fuck up. <laughs> right? And I'm just like, like, uh, sorry, Gotham, right? And, I'm, and then I'm away. And it, but like that whole, that whole time in F Company um, doing shit like that was amazing. It was just a, was a, a different world, eh? Aye. Paul, did you, come, did you go to Barmoral with her? You did, didn't you? Uh, no. So you went to so you went to the battalion if, if in the battalion because we went to Balmoral. But do you leave before we went to them? Yeah, you must have done. So I was in I, I went to the F company for nine months. And you went to the battalion, right? Then so straight to Cataract. So they were in Cataract still, right? Right. Yeah. And then it was just a, it was just an amazing time. And then uh some arsehole went in, you know, when I'm pre preparing to go to Afghan on my first tour with all my mates. Um, started the pre-deployment training and all that and went through the whole fear uh, going over there and my, all my mates came and seen me and worked, worked my, helped me sort out my head. And then I started to get excited and then some arsehole crashed the car on the way back to Cataract for Edinburgh. I break my back, crush my spine and then, oh, and then it was like Eventually, when I did get back doing the cataract and stuff, um, I was put back on drugs for the doctor. Opiate drugs. So I'm a drug addict. For the again. Pain. And then 
I'm still fighting, right? I'm still really fighting mentally. Like, I'm still wanting to go, and I'm begging. I was begging to come to Sergeant Major at the time. Like, please let me go over. Even if I kind of do what I would have, just let me go over with my with my pals and stuff. Or I need to go over. Um, I had this on. Had this on. Just this need to to go over there and no be left out, right? So, and then it was like, you're back. Listen, you're back. Can you can't even fucking carry the Bergen, and you can't carry the weight. What happens when your pals get shot? Are you gonna be able to pick them up? And I was like, probably no, sir. He said, well, shut the fuck up then, right? You're not gonna be able to go. Is that with C so Company be, or I? C Company, aye. So yeah. I got put in the stores and that, and then doing all the rehab, and then they said, well, med- medical discharge is probably most likely for you. So um, 2015, I'm sent back home with a prescription for my opiate drugs back to Edinburgh. I start festering away. I become incredibly jealous. Uh, all my pals, Sean being one of them, obviously, because he was one of my closest mates. Um, I just be, I just became incredibly bitter and sad and angry because I never crashed the car. So why am I being punished? Um, and they're all getting promoted. And I was meant to get promoted first. That's what everybody said because of my age and my fitness. Bogey, you'll climb up the ranks quickly. So, and now all these other people are all getting made up to corporal and sergeant and stuff. So I went very dark for a while um, and then I was abusing all my drugs that I was getting for the doctor smoking a lot of cannabis and stuff again very negative minded and then the wife came in and said oh there's this coronavirus kicking about um, you're going to be locked up for two weeks and you can't go out and I says to her what two two weeks and I'm not allowed to go out she says not you know everybody's the same so I was like, well, what am I going to do for two weeks? And then I was, um, oh, I might write, I might finish this book that I've been writing for like 14 years. I might do that. She says, well, why don't you, why don't you dig out all the paperwork that I nearly burnt three times? So I dug it all out, Scott, and I'm sitting with all the sheets of paper all over the whole flare, trying to make some sense of it. So I write bits I'm writing about when I'm on heroin. There's bits that I'm writing in recovery. There's bits that I've written when I was in Canada at Batas. And uh, there's bits that I'm writing in F Company. Um, all these wee bits and I'm trying to compile it all. And then I'm sitting. Three days, three nights. I'm sitting. And then I think, what am I doing with my life? I'm sitting here depressed, angry, jealous, bitter, twisted. All these negative emotions every single day, right? Is it you already know you've been here before? You know there's that doesn't end well. So in my own mind, I was like, hey, you need to fucking sort yourself out here. So when I'm writing the book, I'm telling people about my heroin issues, and then it's someone's trig- someone's triggering again about the power of the mind, what I was taught that allowed me to get away from heroin. So I thought, I sat there and thought, you know what? I'm going to come off all these drugs and my back's in shit state and it is right now as well. I'm in a lot of physical pain, right? But I had this great idea. What would happen if I stopped and, and tapered off all the drugs that the doctors are giving me that have told me I'm going to be on drugs for life? All of them. Spinal specialists, my GP, Paul, accept it. You're on all these drugs for life. And I says, what about if I defy them? And I say, no. I might be. But there's only one way I'm going to find out if that's the case. And that's to stop the drugs. Yeah. So I'm three years, three years now drug free, right? Now, I thought, right, what am I going to do? So I thought, what all this social media, right? I'm not going to have a publisher or a marketing team. I'm going to take myself up the stairs, put a, a shirt and tie on with my guard's tie. Right, the shit. I'm going to hit live on Facebook and I'm going to sit. Yeah, it was good, right? And it's like, you know, I, I cringe when I watch it now, right? But what I decided was, do you know, I'm never I'm never going to be a hero. I've never, you know, that is one of the, it was a title in basic training when I was telling everybody about my life and they all said, write a book. The plan was to go to Afghan and come back and write about my life 
and I thought Hero into Hero is quite a catchy title. So that was where the thought process. But yeah. when the car crash happened, Scott, and I never got a chance to go over, um, I nearly burnt the book three times, like I said, but the, even the title, I didn't like that title because it says Hero and I'm not a hero, I'll never be a hero. And that's still the, the case today. Yeah. However, when I'm sitting about what I'm going to do with my life, planning ahead, I'm thinking to myself, right, well, do you know what? I'm going to publish the book. I'm going to give every single penny of this book away to the homeless people in Scotland. And I'm keeping the title. And I'm going to earn that title for the rest of my life, even though I will never, to the day I die, ever, ever regard myself as a hero. And I've had a lot of criticism for especially veterans and serving soldiers with that title. Never right, judge a book by its cover, folks. Right? So... Well, for the battalion, thought, what, for the for, for the battalion boys, same got what boys for the battalion like. There's been a lot of negativity with, regarding this book, but it's because they've not given me the opportunity to 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 read the book or to ask me. The the title came for basic training when I had this belief that going on tours and stuff and writing a book about it, yeah. and then I could head on to hero. So, but during that moment at lockdown when I'm stuck in the house. I decided I'm keeping the title because if nothing, these homeless people that are sitting, sleeping in my military sleeping bags with my boots that I've supplied and my socks and my equipment that I've bought for the sale of this book, I keep the title here at the hero and I'll own that shit and I'll, and I'll defend it. So that's, that's, I, you know. I saw it, like you say, Paul, what took Paul say? A long time to to get up and running, um, but if just to summarise, mate, obviously what the money has gone towards is the homeless in Scotland, um, and also what you're doing, mate, you make a big, big difference in the books. I've gone through this one and some of the stories. You're like Jesus Christ, man, and the missus, she's, she's been in tears reading this one because obviously we can't read books at the same time. My mum, my parents, they want to read it, so once it's done, that we're getting past the book, mate. You know what I mean? Um, I says, well, buy it, mum. I went that because I've says people spend that money in crap. You yeah. know what I mean? This has got to be a good cause. It's got it's, it's got to help one if I can like you say you can help one person, mate, then you're happy, you know what I mean? I'll say that and I know you've lost a lot of money, mate, and that's that's fantastic. Um so Paul, did this this book came about mentioned somebody and it mentioned it was in basic training, you said then. So that was your initial idea when you were in training. This is this what I want to do. So if anything did happen. When you were in, you, you couldn't even know. Oh, behold, it did happen. Which was their fault, your own. Um, the book, yeah, it's amazing, man. I just, you've done brilliant, mate. And I'm proud of you. And I'm proud to call you, mate, and serve you that, mate, at the time. You know what I mean? It's just reading it and reading somebody what somebody's been through. And it's like, because I was being brought up as there's always somebody worse off than yourself, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, oh, you're an inspiration, mate, yeah. You know what I mean? And never, never think you're, you're not doing great because you are, mate. And even Palmer said that the other what a guy, I says, oh, he's brilliant, man. You know what I mean? And Paul's just doing it to earth. Can there's, there's none of this, oh, I'm this, I'm that. You know, like that, Paul, you're just same all the way, mate. Since I've had no fast force, mate, you have no change of it. And also, what you're doing, mate, is fantastic. Um, so, who actually published the book? Did you need to pay for that yourself, Paul? Like, the actual, the actual hardbacks and that? No. No, so, when when it, when it came to the stage, actually, it was on the phone with a publisher. And, and they're telling me that um, it could take between three and five years. And I, and I says to the person on the phone, it was a publisher down in London, that I was on the phone to, right? And I says to them, they say three, they say three to five years? I says, wait a minute. I says, I'm donating all the money for my book to the homeless people in Scotland. I says, have you any idea how many people are going to die as a direct result of homelessness between now and the, over the next three to five years? I says, that's not good enough. She says, I completely understand where you're coming from. Have you ever thought about self-publishing? I says, what's that? She says, basically, you can use, there's loads of sites, Amazon being one of them, and basically, you you get your own cover, you get your own editor, you do, you go get other things, and you publish it for free. Right. So, it wasn't going to cost me any money. Which is Within good. 
uh, uh, within 72 hours, because um, me and the wife, well, the wife done it, right? I'm not going to take any, any praise, right? The wife uploaded it on Amazon, sat with the computer, she uploaded it and the book cover, done the blurb, um, and it got, got a message for Amazon. Within 72 hours, your book will be available to buy. And right. then w within the first 24 hours, I went on Amazon because I was on every minute, every hour, scrolling, hero and hero, hero and hero, and boom. I seen it, I was like, hey, look, that's my book. So it never cost any money, you know? And, brilliant, and that's... Brilliant. brilliant, Paul. So you're, also your aim, your aim also is it's about your life and stuff like that, but your aim also there is, a, is to raise the money for the homeless. And Paul, how much money you raised so far with the, with the book sale? Don't mind me asking to, to go to that charity. So the... The first book, Heron to Hero, yep. that one, yeah. So all the money for that one is going to homelessness in Scotland. It's 15,500, 15, I think. Maybe Fantastic. a little bit more. Fantastic, but, man. So basically what I decided to do with that was, um, so I've drove all across Scotland myself, gone out and meeting some of the, the homeless people in Scotland. So it's, been, it's been hard work, Paul, you know what I mean? It's not been easy for you either, you know what I mean? No, it's hard. It's hard work, um, but it's the for my for my mental health now. That's a um, A good feeling in it. Yeah, uh, I, mean. I when I'm helping, when I'm helping other people that are less fortunate than me, that didn't really have anything, and I'm able to go up and give them sleeping bags or stuff, and I see, shake their hand or hug them and talk to them. And I can see the gratitude in their eyes and the tears in their eyes. And see when that when I hand somebody a sleeping bag, Scotty, and, and I see a tear rolling down their cheek, like it absolutely melts and breaks my heart. And I feel angry. I feel anger. And it's oh, there's government that I th nobody should be homeless nowadays. Nobody, they've got no. us here. Nobody should be. And no. I'll, I'll tell you a story. But I was working in Glasgow, um, with Scottish Provident in security, and it was Christmas. I think it was. Maybe a week before Christmas, I think it was. And up at Charing Cross Station, there's a guy in a tent. And I went like that, okay, who's that guy got? For Christmas Day, his new family. And I sat and spoke to the guy. Um, and he was ex-army as well, by the way. And he says to me, you had to sell my medals to get food. I went, you're having a laugh. I went, you know, go to the council. He said, there's no helpers. So basically, that guy, I took him. Don't it, there's like a restaurant kind of place, like a wee burger place. Sat with him for hours and hours. This is also after a night shift. You know what I mean? Because at the time I lived, I lived in Coke Bridge at the time. Um, and his story like that, Jesus Christ, man. Can these guys, are, there is homeless, like also normal, but, but the, I think the majority, like for like veterans, there is a lot on the streets as well, Paul. Yeah. But I know as, as your aim is, as a whole is to stop that in Scotland. Um, it, is it getting better? I think it is. But it could be better. You know what I mean? And I think what you're doing, mate, with these books, I think it's going to make a big, big difference, Paul. Yeah, so just to summarise, mate, listen, thanks very much for coming on, mate. I appreciate what you're, what you're doing. Um, and also with the books, I'll promote the books as much as I can. Um, like to my family, I've got a few friends who want to buy it now as well. And I've got a mate, he bought it, he bought the first one and he says, and he's a book bug, has become. He's always got a book and he says, fantastic. And he's reading it a second time. So he's back on it again. So that's how good it is. So Paul, I just want to say thanks very much for coming on, mate. I know you've got a busy lifestyle as well, but I appreciate that, mate, coming on and speaking to me. Um, also, guys, this will go up on my platforms, on my Facebook and my YouTube. Get a like. You know what I mean? Give me a message, Paul, a message. If you're struggling, speak to somebody. That's all I can say. Um, you know what I mean? There's always somebody worse off than yourself. But what Paul's doing is fantastic, man. I just can't kind of thank you enough, mate. Not mean it's giving me a bit of inspiration as well. Reading, reading this one. For some day it was that bad. The army having that injury, so that must have been a big thing for you as well, Paul. Having that, that happened. Then to do this, you know what I mean. So this shows you your mental state. Listen, you can't give up. You know what I mean. That's the message I'll be to as well. Listen, if you're in a bad place, text me. I'm on a phone call away. You know what I mean. So Paul, just want to say thanks very much for coming on, buddy. Um, and we'll speak to you soon, guys. Thanks very much. Go and get the book, guys. Please go and buy it. Please. Like I said, you buy that and spend the money in crap. You'll not be disappointed. You know what I mean? Go and get them, guys. Cheers, guy.
Right, thanks, Paul. We'll speak to you soon, buddy. Bye-bye. Thank you, mate.